The following program is an original production of Link TV. A look inside Iran. An inside look into Iran-U.S. relations and the history behind the politics of the Iranian government. This program was recorded at the Commonwealth Club of California. I always wanted to do this. <laughs> Good evening. I'm Jamal Dejani, director of Middle Eastern programming at Link TV and producer of Mosaic World News from the Middle East. I welcome you to this meeting of Inforum, a division of the Commonwealth Club by and for young people who share an interest and passion for civic issues. Barely a day goes by without hearing more ominous news about Iran, whether it's reports about the country's nuclear program or evidence of its involvement in the sectarian violence in Iraq. Up until the issuance of the National Intelligence Estimate Report on December 3rd of last year, many analysts and members of the media believe that the Bush administration has been gearing up for a military strike on Iranian nuclear facilities. We then saw President Bush in January touring the Middle East in an attempt to isolate Iran from its neighbors. Meanwhile, the Iranian president continues to defy the West. This past Monday, Iran celebrated the 29th anniversary of the victory of its Islamic revolution, and in a speech to tens of thousands of marchers, he vowed that Iran would continue its nuclear program despite international pressure. Tonight, we are taking a look inside Iran to demystify our so-called enemy and to share a fresh understanding about the future of our relationship. In this discussion, I'm joined by Barbara Slavin and Dr. Abbas Milani. Barbara Slavin is currently a senior fellow at the U.S. Institute of Peace for Peace on leave this year from her role as senior diplomatic correspondent at USA Today and author of Bitter Friends, Bosom Enemies, Iran, the U.S., and the Twisted Path to Confrontation. Dr. Abbas Milani is the Mukaddam Director of the Iranian Studies Program at Stanford University and co-director of the Iran Democracy Project at the Hoover Institution. Dr. Milani is the author of many books, including The Persian Sphinx and, most recently, Lost Wis Wisdom, Rethinking Persian Moder Modernity in Iran. Please welcome Barbara Slavin and Dr. Abbas Milani. These days, Americans have so much on their minds. They're worried about the battered U.S. economy, unfinished business in Afghanistan, and ongoing war in Iraq, among other things. Should they also worry about Iran, Dr. Abbas? Uh, I, I think they should, uh, but so should the Iranian people. And the ones that have to take care of Iran are first and foremost the Iranian people themselves. Uh, I, in my mind, the regime in Iran is obviously a, a regime that is uh, keen on uh, oppressing its people and uh, exporting its version of uh, Islamic revolution. But uh, if there is to be any stopping of this danger, it has to come from within Iran and by the Iranian people themselves. Yeah, I think the chances for a U.S. attack on Iran have uh, diminished dramatically since the national intelligence estimate came out. There's been a lot of contro controversy about it, but the way in which it was written, beginning with the comment that Iran had halted its military nuclear program, uh, kind of pulled the rug out from under the Bush administration in, in many ways and those who had been pushing for some sort of military attack. I think there, there is still some speculation, perhaps some danger, that Israel might mount an attack on Iran. Uh, Iran has a nuclear reactor which was started by the Germans and finished by the Russians that's about to come online this year, and that might be one potential target. But I, I still find it difficult to believe that's going to happen. You know, there, there are sanctions on Iran, new sanctions, which have, are having some effect. And Iran is going into a very active uh, political season, parliamentary elections in March, presidential elections next year. And the sense is, and my hope is, that outsiders will not interfere in these elections, but will allow Iranians at least to try to express themselves without pressure from the outside, and to vote on the economic problems in their country, which are caused by their current uh, leadership, their current president, Mahmoud Ahmadinejad. So I think the, the chances are, are diminished. Also, the U.S. wants a, an exit strategy for Iraq. If we attack Iran, 
The level of violence in Iraq will probably increase because Iran will encourage Shiite militias to attack Americans there. And we have instability in Pakistan as well, another good reason to not start yet another war in the Middle East. I mean, do you, do you still uh, believe that the military option is off the table? Well, the president says it's not off the table, that it's never off the table. Um, but I think the, the real chances for it happening before Bush leaves office are, are, are less than, than they were perhaps before that NIE came out. And uh, I, I don't know. In my book, I quote uh, Richard Haas, who's a former senior administration official, as saying the chances are two out of 10. That still sounds a little high to me. Uh, in January, I mean, talking about the diplomatic now route, if the military option is a maybe, but in January, President Bush toured the Middle East in an attempt to isolate Iran from its neighbors. But now, it appears that there is a rapprochement between the Arabs and the Iranians. Saudi Arabia has invited Iranian President Ahmadinejad to perform the Hajj this year. Qatar invited Ahmadinejad to take part in the Gulf Cooperation Council Summit for the first time. And Egypt opened a diplomatic channel with the Iranians and each received officials uh, from the other's country. And just today, Iraq's Minister of Foreign Affairs, Hoshar Zibari, confirmed that Ahmadinejad yeah. will be visiting his country in March. Dr. Melandi, do you think that the Bush's diplomatic strategy is failing? And if the military option is off the table, or it's a maybe, and now this doesn't seem working. What's, what other alternatives do we have? Well, I, I don't think the Bush strategy is failing. I think it has failed. Uh, I think the uh, Iranian regime today is in a far better position in every aspect than it was when the Bush administration took over, in terms of their position in the Middle East, in terms of uh, their position in Iraq, uh, their biggest enemy, Saddam Hussein is not only gone, but a regime that is essentially composed of allies of the Iranian regime. Many of these people lived in Iran for the uh, duration of the war, is now in power. Uh, and the rest of the region, I think, has come to realize that the Bush administration doesn't have a coherent, cogent policy. And uh, in everywhere, I think, the, this Bush administration's policies have been for the regime in Tehran, a godsend. They could not have hoped for a better uh, strategy on this side to strengthen their hand in every field on the other side. Do you feel uh, that Ahmadinejad is playing the waiting game? We know now we have basically uh, three uh, candidates uh, remaining. Obama is one, and Clinton, and uh, of course McCain. Obama is the only one that uh, said that he'll negotiate or he'll have a dialogue. So what they have to lose? They'll just sit and buy more time. Well, uh, first of all, Clinton has also said that she will negotiate, but Obama said she'll negotiate the first day without any condition, which I mm -hmm. think is a very wise right. policy. Uh, and I think uh, they, uh, any of these uh, three people uh, that will come, uh, the, they will have to rethink the policy on Iran. And I think it's, to me, self-evident that not only they have to rethink it, I think they have to develop a policy. The Bush administration, and to a lesser extent, the Clinton administration and Bush senior have not, have, uh, had, not had a policy on Iran. They have been in a series of reaction, reactive modes, going from one extreme to the other using uh, the worst language, the talk of uh, axes of evil at the time where the most friendly to the US uh, folks were in power in Iran. So this mishmash that goes for policy and is in fact an absolute absence and failure of policy has helped them. And any of them, I, even McCain with his uh, bomb, bomb, bomb uh, strategy will have to rethink and develop something more wise and cogent. Barbara. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I think probably a lot of people in, uh, here do not know that there have been uh, multiple overtures from uh, the U.S. to Iran and from Iran to the U.S. over the last uh, 10, 15 years, which have, have not succeeded. Uh, Clinton uh, imposed total sanctions on Iran in 1995, and then he turned around after the Iranians elected 
uh, a reformist, uh, Mohammad Hatimi, as president in 1997, and he started making overtures to Iran at that time. Uh, they were reciprocated to some extent, but not, not fully by the Iranians. And then when George Bush came in, uh, the Hatimi administration in Iran made a number of overtures before 9-11 and particularly after 9-11 which the Iranians saw as a chance to, to really change the strategic picture in the region because Iran and the United States were on the same side against the Taliban, against Al-Qaeda. Iran gave assistance to the U.S. in Afghanistan. And we actually had talks from 2001 through the spring of 2003 with the Iranians on a number of issues, including Afghanistan, Al-Qaeda, and even to some extent Iraq. Then in, in the spring of 2003, the Iranians made an offer for comprehensive negotiations between the two countries. And I've printed it in the annex to, to my book. It's a, an extraordinary document. This is when Hatimi was still president, before the Iranian nuclear program had accelerated. And it listed all the issues of concern to the two sides, um, you know, everything from the nuclear program to Iran's policies on Israel, support for militant groups, and so on. But President Bush, uh, in his uh, great wisdom, decided not to uh, answer, not to even respond to this overture because the feeling in the United States at the time was that everything was going great. We'd just gotten rid of the Taliban, gotten rid of Saddam Hussein, and Iran was going to be next, so we didn't need to bother to talk to them. So I would hope that the next administration might take a look at that offer that was made in 2003 and see if perhaps something similar might be put on the table now. Let me tell you what uh, they say uh, on the Arab street, at least, uh, regarding this topic. You mentioned before that Israel might strike or conduct a strike against Iranian nuclear facilities. As a matter of fact, today, Ehud Olmert was in Germany, and he uh, you know, reiterated that Iran must be stopped and, and, and so forth. Now, there is a perception, this is on the Arab street, that the U.S., in effect, is uh, fighting a psychological proxy war uh, you know, with Iran on behalf of Israel. How true is this? Well, it's clear that Iran's nuclear program is more of a perceived threat to Israel than it is to the United States. After all, we're very, very far away, and Iran is not exactly going to attack the U.S. with nuclear weapons. I, I personally doubt Iran would attack Israel. Israel has 200 nuclear weapons. It has submarine-launched weapons. It has a second strike capability. To attack Israel would be suicide. But what an Iran with a nuclear cap capacity would do for Iran, it would increase its prestige, it would uh, perhaps uh, embolden some of its proxies, its partners such as Hezbollah and Hamas uh, would, would be feeling their oats, would be even more provocative in some ways than they already are. I mean, these are concerns, I think. And uh, the former Israeli deputy defense minister said something very interesting. Uh, a couple of years ago, he was asked why Israel fears an Iran with, with nuclear weapons so much. He said that it would frighten uh, Jews from moving to Israel and would, would perhaps induce some Israelis to leave, uh, Israeli Jews to leave, because they would perceive it as an existential threat. So the threat is really more demographic and psychological than it is real. But, but it's not only Israel that would be impacted by this. The Arab states in the Persian Gulf do not want an Iran that is the obvious hegemon in the region because of its uh, nuclear program. The Arab states in the Persian Gulf might not openly articulate their opposition to a nuclear Iran, but obviously they're not going to stand by and allow Iran to become the clear dominant force in the region because of its uh, nuclear we know already they are beginning to talk about launching their own nuclear program. Saudi Arabia is talking about launching a nuclear program. Kuwait, Jordan, and part of the reason uh, that I think the U.S. is involved in this, part of the reason, part of it is obviously Israel, but there are other aspects of it. Uh, it's a, it will lead to an arms race in the Middle East. Uh, it will destabilize some of the U.S.'s allies, like. Kuwait, like Bahrain, like Oman, the Iranian regime, as Barbara said, will become more emboldened. Now they're worried about what the U.S. might do to them. If they are a nuclear state, they think they will have a kind of a, uh, immunity from any outside pressure. And all of these things, I think, together make the U.S. Uh, concerned. And the Europeans. I mean, the U.S., you might say the U.S. is run by Israel. What about the Europeans? What about China? But, but really, how, uh, how, how much of this is a, uh, 
a fear uh, that is caused by the media or by our uh, interpretation of, of Iran's nuclear power. I travel all over the Arab world and Barbara, the same, and when I talk to people there, People there are not worried about Iran. I mean, I'm talking about the average people. I'm not talking about governments destabilizing this government or that government. But the average Arab is more worried about what's going on in Iraq, what's going on on the Palestinian-Israeli front, what's going on in Lebanon, and, of course, other things, the economy. And the last thing on their mind is that hegemony that Iran is going to influence their life uh, one way or the other. I mean, I know a lot, you know, in the West, uh, there has been this talk about uh, the uh, Shiite crescent. I mean, this is a popular thing here, uh, Iran's influence into Iraq, uh, Syria, Lebanon, and, and so forth. But uh, um, a terminology, I think, first uh, coined by King Abdullah of Jordan. How real is this? Or is this a conspiracy created by the West to drive a wedge between Sunnis and Shias, Arabs, and Persians. You want to take a stab at it? Uh, well, first of all, I don't know what Arab streets think. I have no evidence. I, there is, I don't know of any polls that have been done on this. What I do know is what Saudi Arabia has said and done, what Kuwait has said and done, what Bahrain has said and done. And I don't think the tensions between Arabs and uh, Persians are the creation of Israel or the United States. These are old, I can speak on the part of Iran. Iran has had racist attitudes towards Arabs for a thousand years. Iranians have been burning the effigy of Omar in their houses for a thousand years, long before America was even an idea. To say that this is the concoction of American imperialism is looking for the wrong conspiracy. Uh, I mean, you're right about, about this thing. You, you always hear uh, complaints you know, from the average Iranians about the economy, about different issues, and now we have, you know, people are confused what's gonna happen with the, with the upcoming elections. But one thing strikes me is always uh, when you talk about the nuclear program, it, it has become a national pride for the average Iranian. Yes I mean, and no, I yes mean, and no. Uh, at least this is what I've been seeing yeah. on, on, on television. Do, do you feel that it has become, or is it a drain? Um, I, uh, on this one, we have some evidence. There are polls that have been done, actually, and only about a third of the Iranian people have said that the nuclear issue is a life and death issue for them. Uh, a great majority of them have said they want a nuclear program. If you ask um, Iranians, should Iran have a nuclear program when Israel has a nuclear program, I suspect nine out of 10 of them will say yes. But if you ask them, do you want this regime to have a nuclear program, in which case it will stay 10 years longer, I think you won't get too many takers. That's the real question. That's why this regime wants the nuclear program, precisely because it is weak inside, right. it is a vulnerable regime, and it wants to have a nuclear program to make itself impervious to inside and outside pressure. Uh, to me, this is, you know, the regime has had its complete monopoly of telling the Iranian people everything it wants about this nuclear program, and some of the most basic facts have been hidden from the people. The real cost of this, the real economic cost of this, the scientific cost of this. Iranian students are now being barred from universities all across the world simply because Iran wants to enrich uranium. That's a bad deal to make. And if the regime has sold it to the people, and I'm not sure it has, it's so much to the detriment of the regime. This is one more betrayal of the Iranian interest by a regime that only thinks of its own uh, values. Enrichment, uranium, enrichment of uranium was something the United States and Israel did in 1950. It is not cutting-edge science. They're depriving Iranians of cutting-edge science because Ayatollah Khomeini wants to enrich uranium. That's, I think, a bad deal that they have sold to the Iranian people. I don't think people should be fooled by the, the speeches that Ahmadinejad gives and the pictures of demonstrators in the streets of Tehran. I've been in those demonstrations, and they are staged 
government demonstrations. They bring kids in from the schools, they bust them in, they put placards on them saying nuclear energy is our legitimate right, and the kids have to march around wearing these things and chanting slogans. You know, again, if you ask Iranians, uh, the, the, the comparison a lot of Iranians made for me was with Pakistan and India. They say, well, if India can have it, if Pakistan can have it, then certainly Iran can have it. You know, so it is a sense of pride, but they're, they're talking about a civilian nuclear program, not about nuclear weapons which I think the majority of Iranians would say that, that they don't want and that would be more of a danger to Iran in a way than, than, than an advantage uh, to them. But a lot of this is orchestrated by the regime and you really should not be, not be fooled by the, uh, the slogans. But you, know, you want to go by the NIE, that's fine. Go by the NIE. What does the NIE say? The NIE said that they had a nuclear military component to their program till 2003. That is not what the regime has said. The regime has always denied it. Mm -hmm. You cannot take the NIE as a legitimization of the regime's claim. In fact, the NIE says that this regime has been lying. It lied till 2003 because the regime has never said publicly that we have a nuclear military component. They've always said this is for peace purposes. The NIE says they had a military pro program. They stopped it in 2003. And if I was in their place, I would stop the military component too. They need to learn how to enrich uranium first before they can burn the, build the bomb. And they have said so. They have said as much. They said, we need to first enrich uranium. And the 2003 suspension was also in their own words because they realized they need to learn how to make centrifuges first. Right. So they said, why pay this price? We'll suspend enrichment, we'll learn how to pay the centrifuges, and then we'll start it again, which is exactly what they did. I think, Barbara, in your book, you, who, you interviewed uh, Bruce Rydell, former top official on the National Security Council, and you quoted him saying that Israel might strike Iran first. I mean, this is a high possibility, dragging the United States into a wider conflict. Yeah. I mean, is, is this a real threat I mean, from what we're seeing? If, if, you're say, if, we, if what you're saying is true, Israel's not going to just sit idling, right. waiting I think, I think for Iran to complete uh, developing its nuclear program. I think it is a threat, but as I said before, I think there are constraints on Israeli action, uh, concerns about what Hezbollah would do, concerns about uh, what would happen to the Americans in Iraq, uh, and, you know, they would have to have American permission to do this. Let's face it, they could not pull off something like this without uh, informing the United States first. They have, uh, they have to fly over uh, Arab countries in order to get to Iran. Uh, it's also, at least I'm told by experts, the Israelis couldn't really do the job properly alone. They don't have the, the planes that have the refueling capacity. They don't have the, enough munitions to do it. They would need some sort of U.S. support. So Bruce Rydell, who was a senior official on the National Security Council in three administrations, thought that Israel might start it and the U.S. would somehow feel obliged to come in and finish it uh, to the extent one could say you could finish a conflict like this. I'm, I'm afraid that that would be uh, highly uh, uh, optimistic, that one could, could attack Iran in this way and consider it done with a few airstrikes. And Iran today is not Iraq of the 1980s. It's, uh, I mean, uh, I, I don't know, again, if this is propaganda, but every month or so we see the Iranians launching a new missile, testing a new missile. Now they've sent one into outer space. And uh, do you have any information, Dr. Milani, on, on, on Iran's uh, military capabilities? Well, Iran was not even Iraq in 1980. Iran was three times the size of Iraq. Iran is a country three, si three times the size of Iraq. Its military is much, much larger. And when the U.S. invaded Iraq, it was the second time. It was after a war of attrition for nine years where Iraqi forces had been uh, hit, the infrastructure of their military has been hit. Iran has a very robust military. It has a very strong uh, revolutionary guards. Uh, it's a different terrain. It's not a flat land where you could do what the U.S. did in Iraq. I think that's why the military, I think, and the intelligence agencies are so worried that the Bush administration might in fact do this, that that's why they wrote the NIE in a way that <laughs> would obviate that possibility, because they know how stupid this would be. This is not Iraq. It's 10 times worse than Iraq. Yeah. 
I think but I'm gathering from you, I mean, uh, maybe I'm wrong, that there's still a possibility that the Bush administration before its term is ends that might do this because if it, it, Israel cannot do it alone and uh, the United States and Israel do not want to allow uh, Iran to continue, the diplomatic option, which I've been monitoring, it, it, it seems to be a joke that this possibility still hovers around somewhere around there that we're going to see an attack before probably December. Well, President Bush also claims that he cares about the Iranian people and about democracy in Iran, and surely he must realize that the worst thing he can do in terms of, of supporting those Iranians is to, is to attack Iran, because that would, that's the one thing that would strengthen the Ahmadinejad government and cause Iranians to rally around the regime. Which, which is uh, actually a good segue, because you, you, you're right. I mean, this is President Bush has said repeatedly that our argument is not with the people of Iran. Right. It is with the government of Iran. And both of you had lived in Iran. Do you feel that it hold, that this, this holds true for Iranians? Do they feel that their beef is not with the American public, but rather with the government? And how did uh, this relations between our government and theirs become so strained? Iran is the only Muslim country in the world where we know empirically, anecdotally, that the people are pro-America. It's the only country in the Mu Muslim Middle East where the street is relatively pro-American. People don't have a beef with the people. As Barbara said today in her talk, uh, after September 11, it was the only country where there was a spontaneous show of grief and solidarity with the American uh, people. Uh, and the one thing that will sour the good feelings of the Iranian people towards America will be an invasion of Iran. If there is one way to spoil what has become an important political capital, it would be an invasion. And I am not convinced that that possibility is zero. I wish I could believe that, but uh, I think the possibility is much less than before the NIE, but, but it's still, it's still it exists. If those boats that came near US warships, if one of them had come nearer, if one of them had shot an arrow towards the US, or if the US commander was a little bit trigger happy, we would be sitting in a different, we would, have be, we would be having a different discussion today. So the possibility, unfortunately, is, exists. I'm glad you mentioned this. Do you feel, when, when I watch this story, and we watched it, uh, you know, tens of times, both on Iranian TV, and in, especially here in the United States, and actually, uh, this was the only time that the media broke out of the presidential uh, elections and primaries and started talking about Bush in the Middle East when this happened. But somehow I felt like uh, that it was exaggerated in the media, or at least uh, from the Iranian perspective and from the people in the Middle East, they were saying, well, uh, this was just a simple incident blown out of proportion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it was exaggerated. We found out subsequently that there had been a, a, a much nearer miss in December where a U.S. vessel actually fired warning shots against the Iranians, which didn't happen this time. But that wasn't publicized by the Pentagon. This one was, and guess why? Bush was going to the Middle East the next day. So it was part of the strategy of portraying Iran as this reckless, terrible nation, this evil nation, and this great threat to U.S. interests. Now, on the other hand, the Revolutionary Guard Corps of Iran is feeling its oats, and, and they, they like to, uh, to play this cat-and-mouse game with U.S. ships, and some even feel that Ahmadinejad would like not a full-scale war, but some little, uh, you know, incident like this, because it would strengthen him, strengthen his, his uh, followers going into parliamentary elections in March and, and the presidential elections next year. So we do have a kind of gain, dangerous game of chicken that's going on in a very, very narrow and, and very strategic waterway. For the radio audience, you're listening to the Commonwealth Club in Forum program. And tonight, we're taking a look inside Iran with Barbara Slavin, Abbas Milani, and myself, Jamal Dejani. 
Now let's go to the audience uh, for questions. First of all, I, I want to thank George Bush for standing behind Iranian people. He's the only president who stand behind Iranian people. I hope other presidents would do the same. But I have two questions. One question is, America never said they want to invade Iran. I heard that is a surgical operation that they want to go uh, bomb certain places. Could you elaborate what the surgical operation is and how accurately this surgical operation is? I detect from your voice that you're Iranian-American, yeah? Yes, I well, am. Well, you, then you know that Natanz is very close to, I believe, Abiyane, which is on the UNESCO World Heritage a list of, of sites. I mean, there is no such thing as a surgical strike. I was in, uh, in Libya in 1986 when, the, when Ronald Reagan bombed Libya and, and tried to kill Gaddafi in his tent. And this, these surgical strikes, uh, one, of the, one of the planes uh, bombed the French embassy by mistake and some apartment buildings that innocent Libyans lived in killed, among uh, others, a, an 18-month-old baby girl. So there's no such thing as a surgical strike. People will be killed, innocent people will be killed. And also, how can you know whether you're getting all of the sites? I mean, perhaps some of them are hidden. Iran is a very mountainous country. You know, they've had help from the North Koreans who are experts at tunneling and, and putting things in caves. I, I just, I think it's, it's, it's bogus to think you could do this and that you could really manage to eliminate the program. You cannot bomb the knowledge out of the heads of Iranian scientists. They will restart the program. The Israelis, you know, in 1981, they bombed the Osirak reactor in, in Iraq. Iraq had one facility. And what happened? Iraq redoubled its efforts to, to build a nuclear program after that. My understanding, this surgical operation is to destabilize Iranian government, not just particularly for the nuclear plant. So destabilizing government, it would not be in Natanz, probably would be some place for the air defense system or something. So I don't know how, you know, I, I, this is what I like to know. But oh, this again, that's the, wishful the, thinking the, on the part of the Bush administration that this sort of attack would destabilize the regime. You know, it could very well solidify the regime. There are two uh, programs that have been, uh, seek, the two plans that have been divulged by the Defense Department. One of them calls for hitting 10,000 sites. You're sitting in San Francisco and you're hoping for 10,000 sites in Iran to be hit in a surgical strike. Would you be willing to have your son and daughter next to one of these sites in the city of Esfahan? No, I don't. So uh, the idea Iran. of a surgical strike in Iran is a great myth. The Iranian regime not only has put it in, by in, uh, Natanz, many of the most important surgical s s sites are in the city of Esfahan. Yeah, the most beautiful They've Muslim been city in the world. built underground in Esfahan. Mm -hmm. If they use bunker busters, <clears throat> which is what they have to do, I suggest you read a study by concerned scientists. They estimate the radioactive material that will come out of this will kill up to 700,000 Iranians. And this is before Boucher is operational. If Boucher is operational, and it is to be six months, and they hit that, you can expect something like a, a Chernobyl to affect. And to wish that to happen, uh, even to this regime, because it will kill a million people, uh, I think is killing the uh, baby and babies uh, with the bathwater. My second question for Mr. Milani is, you said the regime is going to be changed within how many years? You estimating 50 years, 10 years, 5 years? Thank you. <clears throat> Maybe I should say 50 so that I won't be alive by then. <laughs> and you can't come and grab me and say you promised 50. I, I really don't know. But, you know, it is the economy, stupid, as famously he said. And if a regime cannot solve a society's problems and it cannot offer them hope, uh, it cannot remain. And I think this regime is eminently incompetent and corrupt beyond belief. And it's not going to be easy. You know, we were talking with Barbara on the way here. 
It is estimated that Iran has seven million addicts. Mm -hmm. Heroin addicts. Opium and heroin addicts. Tomorrow they give Iran to you. How are you going to solve that problem? You have a bureaucracy where everyone is on the take. You have a postal service that won't deliver your mail if they don't get a bribe from you. They do. They don't. I mean, this is reality. And it's not the postman's fault. The postman can't make ends meet if he doesn't take the bribe. Everybody is taking from everybody. That's the moral corruption that this regime has brought to the very fiber of Iranian society. It's going to take a long time to fix it. Yes, ma'am. Uh, to the panel, um, would you please explain what would be the role of uh, Raf Sanjani in all this? We have never spoken about him. She interviewed him. I've interviewed him. He's quite a character. <laughs> uh, Raf Sanjani, you know, he, he represents the revolution in, in, in some of its uh, worst aspects in a way. His family is, has become fabulously rich. They were pistachio farmers uh, before the revolution. Uh, in a place called Rafsanjan, and then he was one of the leading lights of the revolution. He's been a very important figure. He was a president for two terms uh, after the Iran-Iraq war, and his family is reputed to have its fingers in just about every pie in, in the country. At the same time, he's a very pragmatic individual. He's very pro-business, and after the Iran-Iraq war, he set about trying to reconstruct the country. He was the first to really invite uh, members of the Iranian diaspora to come back to the country to reclaim their property, to invest in Iran again. And he began a process of social relaxation. It didn't go that far. Hatemi very much uh, continued it and intensified it. Uh, but he also was someone who he ran for president again. He couldn't run for a third consecutive term, but he ran again in 2005 on a platform of improving relations with the West. And he certainly suggested that he would be amenable to some kind of deal about the nuclear program, uh, that would, he would put some limitations on it in, a retu in return for uh, a lifting of U.S. and other economic sanctions against Iran. So he's, he's an important character. He has uh, two sons, two daughters, three sons, two daughters, who are all very interesting and influential. He actually has a daughter who I think would have made a, a, a great president of Iran, uh, Faizeh Hashmi. Uh, a real firebrand. She uh, tried to run for president and she was told no, women cannot run for president. And so she went off in a huff and she's gotten a doctorate at Oxford, I think, or Cambridge mm -hmm. in international relations. She started a, a couple of newspapers. She was in charge of the Women's Athletic Association for a while. Very interesting. And then he has sons who are, who are interesting as well. One of them said something to me in 2005 which got his father, got his father in a lot of trouble. He said that if Rafsanjani were elected president again, he would make the supreme leader like the King of England, uh, namely a ceremonial function. Uh, needless to say, the supreme leader didn't like this very much, and, and Abbas Milani thinks that's one of the reasons why he tilted toward Ahmadinejad, and Ahmadinejad won in 2005. Uh, as long as Rafsanjani is, is breathing, he will be important in that regime. Currently, he heads a, a group called the Assembly of Experts, which, is in, uh, which will choose the next supreme leader uh, if Khamenei dies or is incapacitated. Rafsanjani heads a body of 86 clerics who will choose the next supreme leader, and that's pretty important. Do you want to add something, Dr. Milani? Uh, <clears throat> I just want to add that in the last year of his in presidency, at least 3,000 prisoners were killed in Iranian prisons uh, when just before signing the peace agreement with Baghdad with Iraq, Ayatollah Khomeini ordered a cleansing of the prisons, and Mr. Rafsanjani was presiding over the murder of at least 3,000 innocent prisoners. Some of them were tried for 30 seconds. They were asked three questions, and if they trembled, if they gave the slightest wrong answer, they were sent to the firing squad. There is a, PhD, there is a, a doctoral dissertation at Harvard University Law School written by a young Iranian who documents all of this and considers that crimes against humanity and Mr. Rafsanjani is one of those people who is on that list. So his hands are not clean? I think his hands are, as we say in Iran, up to here in blood. Yes, sir. Hi, I had a uh, quick question. Um, sometime in the past year or two, an academic at Johns Hopkins University released a report saying that Iran's oil producing capability, capabilities are diminishing, 
and that sometime in the next few or several years, uh, domestic demand is going to outstrip uh, production, thereby they won't have enough oil to export and it's all going to be consumed internally. And I'm wondering what kind of effect is this going to have uh, on the economy and the domestic politics of a country sitting on one of the three largest known oil and gas reserves in the world? You know, this is where the West and the United States in particular have, have leverage over Iran because Iran desperately needs Western technology to renovate its oil fields. Uh, now, it's getting some help from the Chinese, from the Russians, but uh, for certain types of, of procedures, when you have these old oil fields, they need to have gas injected and all sorts of procedures. I'm told that, that the American companies, European companies, are much better at this, and they're not providing this help. Iran also has huge reserves of natural gas, but it doesn't know how to exploit these reserves. It has to, to, to liquefy the natural gas and so on. For this, it also needs Western technology. And so I think that these pressures we are something that definitely will play on the Iranian regime in the future, and it's, it's something that the West should keep in mind and, you know, could be traded, perhaps, this expertise could be traded for strict controls over the Iranian nuclear program. But, Dr. Milani, isn't this uh, the argument that the regime is making why they need nuclear energy? Uh, well, the regime's argument about the nuclear energy was that the price of gas and oil will increase to a level where it will become economically viable. I think now, for the first time, the price of gas and oil is at the level that the regime's argument makes sense. Uh, up to a year ago, they wouldn't have done it. Uh, I think price of gas and oil has to be at $60 for the Iranian economic. Uh, uh, one of our students, an uh, Iranian-American student, uh, Mojana Mawassad, did a uh, uh, honors thesis at Stanford where she did the economics of this and found that about 60 for gas, uh, for oil is the economic. Uh, the Iranian government itself has done a study that says if they do not bring in 50 to 60 billion dollars for the next 10 years, that's 500 billion, then their economic, their, they will be in trouble because again, the export, the production of oil will diminish. The study that you're referring to says in 2015, uh, Iran won't have any because of increased population, increased usage, and decrease in production. It's a very good article by a guy called Stern. You can access it online. Um, quick follow-up question. Assuming nothing changes, 2020, what's going to be the situation in Iran? <laughs> I mean, in We terms might have of regime change. In terms <laughs> of oil. You know, from within, at the rate things are going. I mean, from what I understand, the inflation is terrible, you know, people are really having trouble making ends meet. Uh, it's, it's particularly hard on the lower middle class, the working class that Ahmadinejad said he was going to, to help. You know, when he ran for president in 2005, his main opponent was Rafsanjani, who's very rich, and he said that he was going to put oil, the, the oil money on the tablecloth that Iranians eat upon, you know, traditional families, they spread a cloth on the floor and people sit around around the cloth. It's called the sofra. And this was what he was going to do. And he's failed. So I think these contradictions, these pressures will have an effect, assuming that the external environment is conducive and that, that we don't muck it up. You know, let it work through the Iranian system by itself. I think uh, we can continue this discussion for the next six hours. Unfortunately, we ran out of time. Please give a big hand to Barbara Slavin and Dr. Abbas Milani. Now this meeting of the Commonwealth Clubs and Forum is adjourned. <laughs>
Link TV is the only U.S. network dedicated to global and national news, uncompromising documentaries, and diverse cultural programs. Programs that connect you to the world.